congregation, but I am so excited to be able to lead and worship this morning. Would you stand as we worship Jesus? place this morning.
believe in you for what you've done for us, Jesus, that great gift that you've given us because of your love. Yes, Jesus, we love you and we praise your name in this place tonight. Jesus, we thank you this morning for your victory on the cross. And we are, as your word says, the trophies of your grace. We celebrate your victory and we humbly receive your love and your grace. We do that together as your family, your sons, your daughters, your body. Church, would you be seated this morning as we prepare to receive communion? You should have on the seat near you or the seat you're in a little communion packet that looks like this. If you're unfamiliar, it's kind of a two-part thing. 
you peel back the top part of it and you'll find the bread there underneath and then there's a second lid and you peel that back and there's the, the juice the fruit of the vine the Bible tells us that some friends bought a, brought a desperately sick man to Jesus he was paralyzed couldn't even bring himself to the Savior, to the healer. And they had to, they had to dig through the roof because the place where Jesus was teaching was so crowded and full. And they lowered the man down to the Lord, and everybody expected that Jesus would say, You're healed, rise and walk. But he didn't. Instead, he said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Take heart. Most of those who were there would have thought that man's greatest problem was what was wrong with his body. But Jesus knew it was what was going on in his spirit. So he said, your sins are forgiven. The crowd said, who is this? How can you do that? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus said, I know. I'm among you. I'm here. He said, now I'm going to heal this man of his paralysis so that you will know I have authority to forgive your sins. This morning he comes to you and me and he says, I have authority to forgive your sins. I will do it here and now. I offer you the gift of my grace. So on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Let's receive the gift. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you freely give us again and again and again. We thank you for paying the price on the cross for allowing your body to be broken that we might be forgiven and set free. We worship you, Lord, and we receive from your hand that which cost you so much and that which you give us for free. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. The Bible says afterwards he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. He said, you know what? What I have done for you on the cross not only covers the past, it stretches out into your future. It stretches out into my future. He said, take and drink in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. Lord, we are grateful this morning for what you have done for us. And we worship you in this place. We delight to be called your sons and daughters, the family of God. Be glorified in our hearts as we continue to worship you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we continue in worship? It's Jesus who given everything for us. We worship you.
Jesus, we praise you. Let's sing that one more time. Let's sing Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Yes, Jesus, you wash us white as snow. And we worship you this morning. And Jesus, we love you so much. And we just pray this morning that you would be with us as we worship you in your house, God. We love you, Jesus. And all of MRCC said, amen. As you greet the person next to you on the way back to your seat, would you tell them your favorite Thanksgiving sigh this morning?
My mic. Oh, there it is. Good morning. All right. I don't have a favorite side dish, but I have a least favorite side dish. And I'm going to tell you, and I might get some heat for it, but I'm okay with that. Green bean casserole. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First service, the support was kind of there. Oh, man. I'm not alone. Sweet. All right. Well, my name is Tyler. I'm here on staff at MRCC, and I'm just going to give a couple announcements. But before we get to those, we have a few things to celebrate. One, our Operation Christmas Child boxes got sent out, and us as a congregation and community sent out 598 boxes. So, yeah. Yes. And then also yesterday, we had over 60 volunteers come together to decorate uh, the foyer, the kids' church area, and outside for all of the Christmas lights. So can we celebrate that as well? The two announcements that I have are, one, on Wednesday, there are no midweek events. So no youth, no impact, no forged. Also, the office is closing early for Thanksgiving, and we will be closed on Thursday as well. And then coming up on December 3rd is a family movie night. It's going to be here in the sanctuary, 7 p.m. I have to make a joke, kind of a joke, but throw Pastor Greg under the bus because as a staff, when we were talking about the family movie night, uh, he was like, how are you guys going to have a movie night outside? Because we usually have them outside and we're like, Pastor Greg, it's in the sanctuary because it's December. And he was like, oh, that makes sense. So I'm going to get fired now. Uh, but Pastor Greg's going to come up and bring the word. Oh, he's a goofy little guy. He is. Oh, I'll find a way to get even uh, with Ty during the week. But hey, hu- huge thanks, though, like he said, for, uh, for everyone who came out and helped us set up the Christmas lights yesterday and get everything put together. Special thanks to Rich and Jason and Levi, all those guys and gals who are part of the leadership team for the lights. Uh, somebody actually called me at my house last night and said, Pastor Greg, the lights are on and it's not Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, first of all, I was kidding about that. But second of all, I have to, uh, to give you an Ocean's 13 movie reference, all right? Some of you will track with this. I said it's a soft opening this week. We've got a soft opening while we check out all the tech. And actually, there's a reason for that, and there's a reason I'm telling you this. Um, so the lights are on, but what we found out is that this year, after almost 13 years of doing this, our FM transmitter out in the parking lot is starting to fail. That's why we do this soft opening. Uh, so we're going to be replacing that this week. If you come by today or tomorrow night, the signal of the music that synchronizes with the lights might be a little weak. You might want to wait uh, before you invite some friends to come watch it. We- we plan to get that replaced on Tuesday, and then we'll be off and running again. It's just, you know, stuff wears out over time. We've been doing this for a long time. So uh, FYI, uh, if you come down and you have trouble picking up the music signal, that's just God getting even with you for coming down before Thanksgiving. So uh, now, now you know. Uh, but grab your Bible, uh, church, if you would, please, and open it to, um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to jump over to Luke 15 in a moment. By the way, everybody who's joining us online for the live stream, we're thrilled that you're with us today. You are us. Uh, hope you're looking forward to a terrific Thanksgiving, and uh, thank you for joining us for communion as well this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Luke 15, and, and what we're going to do this morning, uh, friends, is, is kind of wind up this, this little mini-series we've done the last three weeks called... Called, called God Sick. Uh, if you leave me to this topic, I'll be on it for a long time. And I felt like the Lord said, let's just do a refresher, a reminder. Uh, and, and, and in these last three weeks, we've been talking about what causes the people of God to end up opposing God. Yeah, it's a, a deep and important subject. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, we saw this two weeks ago, Matthew chapter 23, he said, you know, you guys will travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and then when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Wow, those are tough words. They thought of themselves as passionate for God, and they were actually working against his purposes. The Apostle Paul says the same thing to the Jews in Romans chapter 2. He said, you know what? God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
because of the way you're conducting yourself. That sometimes it's easy for us, the people of God, to lose touch with what God's really doing in this world. And in these last couple of weeks, we heard in the first week that God's sick is when we forget what's most important to God in the moment. Jesus said, all the law and the prophets hang on two commandments. Get these two right, and the other stuff will fall in place. Get these two wrong, and it doesn't matter what else you get right. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and we're God's sake when we forget that that's the point. And then in the second week, we talked about the fact that very often we come to believe that our relationship with God depends on how hard we're trying instead of how hard he tries. That it's his zeal that saves us, not ours. And, and when we get that backwards, we end up God's sake. We end up chasing the wrong parties. This morning, God wants to talk to us the last part of kind of this equation. He wants to talk to us about how there's a difference between being right and being good. Let me say that again. There is a difference, sometimes a crucial difference, between being right about something and being good about something. If, if you've been around MRCC for any length of time, you know that a couple of times a year I bless you with a fresh collection of my favorite puns that I've discovered as the year has gone on. I'm going to do that this morning because sometimes a pun can be right but not good. Let, let me share a few of them with you this morning. For example, after the birth of your first child, your role in life becomes apparent, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's right, but it's not good, right? My wife groans. She says, you're not going to share that in public, are you? I said, you've been married to me, dear, for 37 years. You know I'm going to say this in public. <laughs> Somebody explained the word many to me means a lot. <laughs> if life gives you melons, it means you're dyslexic. Just think that one through. It'll come to you <laughs> in a moment. This girl from the vegetarian club said she knew me, but I never met her before. It's right, but it's not good, you know. I used to date a girl with a lazy eye, but it turns out she was seeing someone else. <laughs> That's real. You heard about the two windmills standing in a field. One says to the other, what's your favorite music? The other says, I'm a big metal fan. I need somebody on the drums going ba pa you know, for this. Just a couple more. You heard about the guy who tried to sue the airlines for misplacing his luggage, but he lost his case. I have no shame. I asked a Frenchman if he played video games. He said, we. Oui. <laughs> One more. I should have been sad when my flashlight batteries died, but I was delighted. <laughs> yeah. Come on now. See how much you have to be thankful for? Yeah. It's possible for a thing to be right without being good. And sometimes that can get real serious. You know, it was when our, our, our son was 16 years old that Ron and I got the phone call that every parent of a new driver dreads. <laughs> Happened at about 2 in the morning. It was the sheriff's department for King County. They called us out of a dead sleep. It was actually a Sunday morning. They called us out of a dead sleep to say, Mr. Dalton, uh, your son's been in a serious accident. <laughs> Boy, that, you know, we, we dread that ever happening, and, and then all of a sudden it was happening in our world. And they said, we need you to come out here to Cumberland, and uh, where the accident has occurred. And so, obviously, I jumped out of bed, threw on my sweats, and, and headed out right away. And, and as I headed out, like any parent, what was going through my mind and heart was all the things I would told him not to do, one of which was not to be out driving after 10 o'clock. The story was he had gone to a friend's house. The friend didn't live in Edenclaw, so what was he doing in Cumberland? You get it. And I, 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 going through my mind as I drove out towards the site was all the things that he knew better that he had ignored and, and had ended up in, in a rough situation. The police officer told me, he says, uh, your car is totaled, so you're going to need to call you know, a tow truck company. And I thought, oh my goodness. But as I drove out there that morning, the uh, Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And he said, you know, Greg, when you get to the accident site, your son's never going to forget in his entire life the first words you say to him. He said, when you get out of the car, the first thing you need to do is make sure he's okay and hug him and tell him you love him 
and you're glad he's okay. I'm glad he helped me with that. We got to the accident site. and it was right there on the bridge in Cumberland, if you know, and the car almost went over the bridge into the gorge. It was totaled, and he was okay. He was fine, and um, I got out of the car and hugged him and loved on him and made sure he was okay. He was crying, still shaking a little bit. I don't know if it was so much from the car accident or my appearance uh, there, but he was shaking, and, you know, the police officer, I think, saw, I think it was wise and experienced officer, he saw what was going on in me and he called me over and he said, you know, I think a deer jumped out in front of him. Uh, we looked at the site, there's a spot back here, he skidded right here, deer cross here, we've seen this before and, and that's what happened and I think, you know, the story he's telling you is true. <laughs> I really appreciated that. But I often think of how I could have been right in that moment and not good. <laughs> how I could have been right in that moment and left a scar on his spirit that would still be there. You see, friends, there's a difference between being right and being good. And Jesus knew that difference. And he lived it in a thousand ways, and he teaches that same distinction to us. So when a woman caught in the very act of adultery was dragged before him, he didn't quibble with the rightness of the Pharisees, but he did teach them how to be good in moments like that. Do you know the difference between being right and being good? That's what God wants to talk to us about this morning, because when we don't know that difference, we become God-sick. We step into moments like I had with my son uh, on that bridge in Cumberland, and, and we do everything wrong even as we think we're being right. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 when he writes to the believers there. And he says this. Listen to what he says. This is heavy. He's going to make a point and then he's going to illustrate it and explain it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 beginning with verse 1. Paul says, now about food sacrifice to idols. Let me pause. If you don't know what that refers to, in those days, uh, meat that you bought in the marketplace was often dedicated to a, a pagan god in a temple before it came to the marketplace. And so believers would argue about whether they should or shouldn't eat it. Some people said, you know what, those gods aren't real. We can just go ahead and eat it, just ignore it. Others said, no, but it's been dedicated to a lie, and so we shouldn't eat it. And believers argued about this stuff. Actually, two whole chapters of your Bible are devoted to this issue because... Every generation of believers deals with similar disputable matters, issues that believers agree about. They don't have to do with sin, but do have to do with our understanding of who God is and how we're to walk with him. And this is one of those. You can read about it in Romans 14 as well. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the same thing. He says, now about food sacrificed idols, about these disputable issues, he says this, we know that we all possess knowledge. Everybody has experience, insight, wisdom, intelligence. We all have it to greater or lesser degrees. We know that we all possess knowledge. And then listen to what he says. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. In other words, there's a difference between knowing something and knowing what to do with what we know about something. Paul says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. Wow, what does that mean? I'm going to break it down. But the man who loves God is known by God. There's a play on words there. I'll come back to that. The man who loves God is known by God. The man who thinks he knows something doesn't yet know as he ought. We all possess knowledge, but by itself, it has a tendency to puff us up when its purpose is to build us up. First of all, that phrase, we all possess knowledge. Sometimes we think that some people are smart and other people are dumb, and usually it's ourselves we consider smart and anybody who does something we don't like who we consider dumb. That's kind of human default. But the reality is, as Paul points out here, everybody has knowledge. Everybody has insight and understanding. I remember when I went into the Marine Corps and for the first time I was thrown into close quarters with guys from all over the country, every part of the country. I'd grown up in Oregon, the Northwest, so I was a Northwest guy, but now I'm with guys from the big cities, from down south, from the Southwest, from the East Coast, just boom, big mob, and, and they're 
cultures and backgrounds are so different. And, and I remember thinking that those first few farm boys that I met from Iowa and Kansas and places like that, these guys are dumber than rocks. I thought to myself, they're just, they just dumb. They don't know stuff. And then I remember one day sitting at lunch and next to us were a couple of guys from Kansas, Iowa, I don't remember where, and, and they were talking about farming business, and they were talking about how many phosphates and nitrates you need to have in your fertilizer at this time of the year, and how you should move these crops around, and how you should move your livestock from this place to that place, and all the math that goes into the business side of it, and I sat there and thought to myself, I'm the dumb one. I don't know any of that stuff. I don't have a clue about how to grow a flower in a pot, let alone a crop in a ranch, you know. I thought to myself, I am, wow, these guys know stuff that I don't even know about, and that was when I first began to realize, you know what, oftentimes I assume somebody's dumb because they don't know what I know. And the truth of the matter is they know a lot of stuff I don't. We all possess knowledge. That's important for us to grasp as human beings. That's important for us to grasp as believers. Paul says not only do we all have knowledge, but he says we're all subject to the tendency of knowledge to puff us up when love builds us up. In other words, knowing something is less significant than knowing what to do with what we know. Yeah, T take that in for a moment because it is absolutely crucial to a healthy marriage, to a healthy family. It's absolutely crucial to a healthy church, to a healthy community. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. When my son was learning to drive, there, there were a million little details I could have laid on him. At. Every time I got in the car with him, he was doing some things wrong. Do you think I went through and categorically identified every single thing he was doing wrong every time? No, nobody does. No good parent does. Because all you'll do is, is teach him not to be confident. All you'll do is teach him to be sort of neurotic in their driving. No, you, you, you teach him some things and then you let him learn other things and you walk with them and... You begin to have gray hair. It's all how you teach a teenager to drive, right? Because you understand that all your knowledge, all your knowledge is meant to serve their learning. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. We got to understand that our smarts are the tools of a servant. Knowledge, all my knowledge, all of your knowledge is meant to help someone else, not to prove that you're somebody. And least of all, to prove that you or me am right. No, that's just showing off. That's puffing up, you know. Um, I'll tell you something uh, about me personally, and that is you don't ever want to invite me to go to a historical movie with you, okay? Because history is my hobby, and all I'll do is nitpick it to death. And I can't restrain myself, all right? If a guy walks out with the wrong rifle, I got to lean over and tell you, you know, that's not actually the right rifle. My wife will not go to a historical movie with me, Okay? <laughs> Sometimes somebody in the congregation, oh, Pastor Greg, did you see that movie? And I'll say yes. And they'll say, what did you think? I say, don't ask me. Please don't ask me. Because you're just going to tempt me to go off, you know, on a, on a tangent. But, but you see the thing, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Really, they're saying, did, did you like it? Did it move your heart? Yeah, that's what knowledge is meant for. There's times when you know something and you shouldn't say it, and you shouldn't prove it, because it's actually better for the other person that you don't. You know, I, I talked to myself when we lived in Coeur d'Alene, I talked to myself in the interest of being out in the community and among people as a pastor should be, I talked to myself into coaching a third grade basketball team. It was an absolute train wreck. I, I just, I was determined to teach these, teach these third graders a couple of fundamentals of basketball in two plays, and I was going to make them run that play so they would learn it, and I'm thinking, then when they're in high school, their coach will come and call me blessed, because I taught them these fundamentals and these plays and stuff, you know, and so I, and I made, I turned those kids into the worst third grade basketball team the world has ever seen, and in fact, we would start a game, and I'd run up and down the sidelines the whole game, tell them, you go here, no, you go over there, no, you run over here. And I'll never forget, a sweet lady came up to me after the, about the third game, and she put her hand on my arm, and she said, Coach, they're third graders. <laughs> and I went, you're right. <laughs> you know, and I had a lot of knowledge, but it wasn't serving where they were. 
And all of us have that tendency. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Love asks, what does the other person need? What's best for them? When is it right for me maybe to not point out the wrongness of some of their thinking or even behavior? And when is it right for me to point it out? In our community of Christ followers, in our church, this is incredibly, terribly important. Friends, a church is a family, not a business, not a corporation, not a franchise of God incorporated. A church is a family. In a family, we have this understanding that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You know, when your teenager is wrong about something and they're, they're laboring through their ignorance, you don't quit on them. You don't say, I cast you out. You don't cease to relate to them. No, you're patient. You work with them. You try to find ways to help them grow and understand. But even if they don't, because they're your teenager, because you love them, you persevere in the belief that someday they will learn those things. And the church of Jesus must be like this, or we will fall into God sickness. Sometimes we just are more concerned about being right than being good. And, and, and this communal angle is why the Apostle Paul says in verse 3, the man who loves is known by God. Like I said, there's a play on words there. It's hard to recreate in the English. But what it's saying, what it's implying is that the man who loves is the, really the smart one, known by God in the sense that God knows his knowing. So the idea is that the really smart one is the one who understands that knowledge is meant to be a handmaiden, a tool, a servant of love. Let, let me ask us this morning as we turn the corner into Thanksgiving, are you more worried about uh, being right? Or are you more worried about what's best for your fellow believer, for your family, for all those in-laws that are going to pour in this week? Are you more worried about being right? Or are you more worried about being good? I remember when I was at Assemblies of God Theological Seminary decades ago in Springfield, Missouri, and the president of the cemetery, uh, cemetery, seminary, the president, yeah, I know, there's a double pun there, just ignore it, all right. The president of the seminary, Dr. Klaus, Byron Klaus, some of you may recognize that name, he'd been a missionary in Central America for 30 years, now he was directing the seminary, and I, I got an opportunity to have lunch with him. And that was kind of an uncommon thing. And, and so we got to sit together and I got to listen to him and his wisdom and experience. And as we got into our conversation, my passion being knowing the truth of God's word, I, I said to Dr. Klaus, I said, Doc, you know, my experiences on the mission field sometimes are hard because I go there and it's just the craziest, most immature, bad Bible teaching, bad theology, bad discipleship. It's everywhere, all over the place. It drives me crazy. I want to move there and give everybody classes forever. <laughs> I said, how, how, do you, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? And he was so wise. He said, you know what, Greg? You're exactly right. I said, you're, I spent 30 years in the poorest parts of Central America. You're exactly right. But see, he said, here's the other side of the coin. He says, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a little storefront church in some ghetto in Panama or Ecuador or Mexico and the pastor, it's like all he did was watch TBN last night and then start barking the next morning. He, he said it, the, his use of the Bible is poor. Their understanding of the truth of God is poor. He said you can see it in a thousand ways all over the place. And then he said, but sitting in the front row is a young father who two months ago was an alcoholic, beating his wife, neglecting his kids, not going to work. And somehow, through that little church, he turned and became a follower of Jesus. Now he's sitting here, loving his wife, serving his kids, going to work. And he says, God just happens even when we're not right. I thought to myself, that's why you're the doctor and I'm not. That's why you're the wise old guy and I'm the young learning guy. Friends, there's a difference between being right and being good. And, and God wants us to grasp that. So Paul goes on to explain it in detail, to, to, to point out the particulars of that, and to say, hey, so then, look at verse 4, about food sacrificed to idols, we know, there's that word, knowledge, we know what's right, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and there's no God but one. That's the right answer. 
For even if there are so-called gods, it's rhetorical. He's saying there are things that are called gods that really aren't. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or, earth, as, uh, or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. In other words, things people call God, things people call lords or authorities. Even though there's lots of those, he says, yet for us, we know that there's but one God, the Father, from whom all things come, for whom we live. And there's but one Lord, and that's Jesus, through whom all things come and through whom we live. In other words, there is an absolute right answer to this question about food sacrificed to idols. There is a right answer. But he says being right about it is less significant than being good about it. Verse 7, he goes on, but not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to idol. And since their consciences are weak, the word doesn't mean weak through neglect, flabby because they haven't tried. It means ignorant, immature, not fully developed. Because their consciences are weak, it is defiled. In other words, they feel a sense of conviction about it. But food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we don't eat and no better if we do. In other words, there's a right answer about this question, but whether you're right or not doesn't make you better or not. Instead, it's what you do with your knowledge. Do you take your knowledge and use it to serve your neighbor? Do you take your knowledge and make it a tool on behalf of your neighbor? I remember sitting with a man who was involved in some questionable stuff in his church and I was meeting him for the first time and it was this health wealth stuff and this power of the pastor stuff all this kind of thing and he was meeting me for the first time and we sat down together we had a great lunch we talked about a lot of things we prayed for each other and then we left and later we went on to become friends years later he came to me and he said Greg in that moment how come you didn't confront me about that stuff and I said oh my friend call him Bill not his name I said Bill let me ask you something. If I had, would you have listened in that moment? <laughs> he goes, no, probably not. I said, that's why I didn't. I said, here's what I saw. I saw your heart. I saw your love for God, your desire for God, your passion for God. And I knew that in time, you were going to figure this out. You were already starting to recognize what was going on. You see, there are times when what we know shouldn't be shared because the good thing to do is to help that person grow in a lesser way. God wants us to have knowledge without worshiping it, to be more than right, to be good instead of being right sometimes. He wants us to know how to use our knowledge to help other people. So the Apostle Paul says, look what he says, verse 9, be careful that the exercise of your freedom, which comes from your knowledge, be careful that the exercise of your freedom doesn't become a stumbling block to your weak brother. Wow, that is a, a mouthful. That changes the whole calculus of relationship. Now all of a sudden I'm saying to myself, what is best for my brother, my sister in this moment? Not what is best for me. I'm not saying what allows me to experience more freedom. I'm saying what would help my brother or my sister? What is best for them? God intends for our knowledge, our rightness to serve other people. Until we understand this, we don't really understand anything least of all the Christian faith. So Paul writes, look at verses 10 and following. For if anyone with a weak conscience, that is with less knowledge, we talked about that a moment ago, sees you who have this knowledge, you who are right, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? And so this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. This weak brother is damaged by your rightness. He says, hey, uh, that's not God's will for you. In fact, he uses strong words. He says, when you sin against your brother in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. You're hurting Jesus. You are being God sick in the name of God, working against God. When you sin against your brother in this way, you sin against Christ. Therefore, listen to how he kind of winds this up. He says, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. Even though I know I have the right to eat meat, even though I know that the fact that it was sacrificed to an idol means nothing, because of my brother, because of my sister, I'll go vegetarian for the rest of my life. And nobody said amen when I said that in first service. And nobody said it in second. But you get the idea. 
In other words, it's not about rights or freedom in this case. It's not about looking, it is about looking out for my fellow believer. The dark side of freedom is it can make us selfish and self-centered. And sometimes we pretend that our freedom in Christ isn't meant to serve others. But it is. When I was in the Marines, you know, they taught us something that I didn't even know I was learning when it happened. Uh, the first uh, about six months of that boot camp in infantry school, they began to teach us something that I didn't realize I was learning even while it was happening. But then later I went, oh my goodness, look what they did. And, and that something was this. They, they began to put us in situations, our company, our unit, they began to put us in situations where we couldn't succeed. None of us could succeed unless everybody succeeded. So if everybody didn't get over the wall, the company failed. If everybody didn't get up the mountain, the company failed. If everybody didn't qualify in the weapons range, everybody failed. And on and on it went. Big ways, little ways, they put us in these situations where we could only succeed if everybody succeeded. And you know what started to happen to us? We all started watching out for each other. The big guys started watching out for the little guys when we had to carry gear up hillsides. And the big guys say, you know what, I can carry more of that than you can. Give me that. And then, you know, in other situations, we're climbing over that wall. Suddenly, you run up to the wall, and you could go over it like nobody's business, but instead you stop, and you watch, and you're making sure everybody else goes over the wall. And we turned into a unit where everybody was always thinking about everybody else. I remember when it hit me in infantry school. Oh, my goodness, look at us. Everything we do, we just automatically take care of each other. That's what knowledge is meant for. That's what God is saying to us here. That's the difference between, between being puffed up and between building up others. Many years ago, I heard a sermon. We're almost done this morning. Uh, I heard a sermon that I'll never forget. It was preached by a quite elderly man. He was actually in his last couple of months of pastoring. He was giving a farewell message. and I was all ears because this guy had been there and done that. And in the message, he used a simple metaphor. He said, you know, in a healthy home where there are children present, the home is arranged for the kids. He was preaching from this passage. He said the home is arranged for the kids. If there's toddlers, you know, you've got those little plugs and all the sockets so they don't stick their fingers or their spoons in there, right? If there's breakables, they're placed up high where they can't reach them. If there's a steep stairwell, they got a little barrier built in front of it so the toddler can't go halfway up and fall down and break her neck, you know? In a healthy home, everything is arranged for the kids. And he said, you can tell whether a home is healthy or not when kids are present by how it's arranged. So sometimes you'll walk into a house and there's no care or concern taken for the kids at all and you can see it everywhere. And you think to yourself, it's actually dangerous for these kids to be in this house because nobody has thought of them. There's a whole backstory to this. If we don't have time to, you get into Leviticus, and there's all these commandments that sound foreign to our ears, but when you go back into the culture, you find out that God was calling his people to build their houses to, to take care of the kids. It's a fascinating subject. But what the pastor said was, hey, in God's church, everything should be arranged to take care of the kids. Everything should be arranged for those who are younger in our faith, who haven't learned what the rest of us know, who haven't had decades of soaking in the Bible to have all the insights that we've gained after all these years. No, no, no. The house should not be arranged for them. It should be arranged for the kids, the young ones, the new believers, the immature, those who aren't there yet, those who are still learning. You know that here at MRCC, we say that the most important thing that happens every Sunday morning is down the hall. It's in children's church. We are here to serve them. It's the same idea. And so let me ask us this. Is your participation in your church designed to help those who aren't right? Or is your knowledge intended to affirm yourself? Yeah. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Or, or to put it another way, do you come to your church for yourself or to serve others? It's amazing and easy to see mature believers because they come to church and they're always looking for somebody else to bless. <laughs> they're always looking for somebody else to serve, to care for, to show hospitality to, to be open to, to pay attention to, to notice. It's amazing. What they've learned is that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And the man who thinks he knows something doesn't yet know as he should, but the man who loves is known by God. You get the idea. Let me finish this morning. Jesus told 
maybe his most famous story about this kind of God sickness. And I thought to myself this morning as I was in prayer before first service, I thought to myself, you know, for some of us, this story is so familiar that we take it for granted. But every time we share it, somebody's hearing it for the first time. The story is found in Luke chapter 15. Jesus is speaking, and he tells a story that begins like this. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between his sons, and not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off to a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, can you imagine at the beginning of this story what's going through the mind and heart of the older brother? We hear this story and we quickly start thinking about nobody but the younger brother. But imagine what's going through the heart of the older brother who stayed home. Imagine what he's thinking. Dad, are you nuts? I know my brother. I've grown up with him. I've lived in the same room with him. I think I know him in some ways better than you do. And you're going to give him his inheritance now? He says, I know how this story is going to end. I've seen this movie. I know what's going to come next. And you know what? The older brother would be right every single time. Scripture says that's exactly what happened. Describing the younger son, verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Sin always has more consequences than we think it would. You know, when we choose to sin, we always say to ourselves, I know there's going to be a price, and I accept those consequences, but it's always way more than we thought it would be. And it always goes on way longer than we thought it would. And and that's what's happening in this younger son's life. The scripture says he ended up hiring himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Guess what the older brother is thinking when he hears about all this? I knew it! I knew this lifestyle would lead to this situation. I knew it all along. I've told him that. I'll tell anybody that. I know better. That's why I'm here not suffering those consequences. I have knowledge. I'm right. And he is right. But all it's doing is puffing him up. And we see that as the story goes on. Scripture says, when he, the younger brother, came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. And now, now the younger brother is starting to learn some things the older brother doesn't know. He's starting to learn about humility. He's starting to learn about repentance and confession. Words nobody loves until we need them. The younger brother is discovering there's no gift so rich and full of reward as the gift of humility and repentance and confession. When we deny ourselves these things, friends, we deny ourselves the richest gifts our souls will ever know. Those puffed up by their knowledge will never discover humility. The older son hasn't, but the younger son is. We all have knowledge. But while he was still a long way off, the story goes, verse 20, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Wow. Imagine what the older brother is thinking now. What? Are you kidding me? After what he's done? After all his wrongs? Really? You're going to go and react to him that way? You never ran down the road to meet me, and I've done everything right. Yeah, knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. The older son in the field is thinking, why is this happening? The older son knows that he knows better than the younger son. He knows where to get your bread truly buttered. He's too smart to waste his inheritance. He knows about work ethic. He knows about faithfulness. He knows about the compounding interests of honoring God day by day and day. And he's living that out. But because his knowledge isn't other-centered, he's too dumb to know what he doesn't know. He doesn't even know his own father's heart. 
When he came near the house, the story goes on, this older brother, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and he asked him, what's going on? The servant said, your brother has come, your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Why? Because he knows he's right. Because he knows what's right. Because he's been living what's right. But all it's done is puff him up and detach him from his knowledge of his own father. Now, now, you know, oftentimes the older brother gets such a bad rap in this story. So I, I want you to see something we, we usually miss. Look at verse 31 of chapter 15. Listen, listen to the father when he speaks to the older brother. Listen to the father's heart when he speaks to the older brother. He, says, he doesn't say, you, you're a wretch, you're a mess. He says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. In other words, you're right. You've been right all along. I love that. You are always with me. That's precious to me. Everything I have is yours. You're my heart. But then he says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know what the older brother had forgotten? He'd forgotten that the younger son was his brother, was somebody that he was meant to love and care about and rejoice in his rescue. Yeah, your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. In other words, you know a lot of stuff, son, but your knowledge is keeping you from knowing the really important stuff. This brother of yours is rescued and saved. And so God says to us, so God says to me, so God says to you, to us as his people, he says, hey, I want you to know there's a difference between being right and being good. There's a difference between being right in your marriage and being good. There's a difference between being right with your kids and being good. There's a difference between being right in your church and being good. And there's a difference between being right in your community and being good. God invites us to reach for the goodness that is the point of the knowledge in the first place. Because knowledge by itself can only puff up, but love builds up. Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, when he said, above all else, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. It covers them over like, like snow covers a junkyard. It covers over a multitude of sins. And I wonder where in your life you need to recognize that, you know what, you have been right all along, but you haven't been good. And as a consequence, you don't even know your father's heart, and he wants you to. He says, hey, you've always been mine. You're right. All I have is yours. But I want to Shift your attention to your brother who's so wrong and needs you to love him. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes this morning? God, we thank you for your word today. And Holy Spirit, I know right now you're speaking to many of us about relationships where we've been right but not good. Father, empower us to learn, to grow, to feel your heart for that lost son. Fill us with your spirit that we might feel for him or her what you feel for them. God, as we go into this Thanksgiving week, teach us to be more than right. Teach us to be good, we pray, that we might give you the reputation you deserve. We pray for that, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, friends? Nudge your neighbor if they fell asleep. Just get them waked up there for a second. Got to tell you, I love me some green bean casserole. That'll be happening at our house. But as we go into this Thanksgiving weekend, let it be, especially as we gather with our families, with an awareness of the difference between being right 
and being good. Now may the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Happy Thanksgiving. Hey, thanks, brother. I'm on. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. I'll see you on Tuesday.